Thank you to Heavenly Father in Heaven for this wonderful time to come together and to allow your powerful word and your spirit to speak to us, be in us, and inevitably speak through us to those that we are in communication with in this world. Lord, there's a lot that's happened in this world for quite some time, and the spirit of Antichrist, which is the devil himself, has come upon us through education of your word instead of taking you at your word. And Lord, we cannot just have the written evidence. We have to allow the spoken word of God to stand true and the written evidence to support it. It's not an or, it is an and. And Lord, I pray that as we study this today and as you lead me on this, this in very in crucial, important uh, subject, Lord, that I will die to myself completely in this moment and that you will indeed work in me and work through me and all those that hear. And may it be a wonderful revelation for us all. And may your word stand true in every way. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And may it be your will, your way, your words. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So I have put together a PowerPoint pre presentation without any assistance. And uh, I think I did it okay. Um, I'm still learning on PowerPoints, Word, Excel, and so on. I've got no problem with, but PowerPoint for some other reason, uh, it kind of never really put enough attention to that, but now I seem to have got it. Okay, so let me just go back to the top. It's not a huge amount of things. There's a, I've kind of cut it a little short today um, because I know the time we have, but um, may the Lord bless us with it nonetheless. And if, if you guys have questions, um, or things that pop up, write it down. We can discuss it um, after this if we have time. All right. So let's jump straight into it. Let me just share screen here quickly. All right. There we go. I, I assume you guys can see that. Okay. All right. And let's go to... Oops. Slideshow, whoopsie, no, 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 no. It's gonna move that so that I can see what's going on here. Oops, nope. All right, and from the beginning. Okay, can you guys see that? We can. Fantastic. Yes. All right, let me just move this up there. I can't move it anywhere else. Right. Hopefully it won't be cut out, but it should be fine. Okay. So it says, title, once again, is what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit, essentially? Because we know it's not a third person. We know it is the declarative power, the mind of God, the power of God, the word of God. It is everything that makes God who he is. It's the inner mechanics of his being. But we're going to be focusing on a specific kind of power that comes from his Holy Spirit. And that is the mind power of God, the way he thinks and the way he moves upon us, because he's not something we can physically see, but his spiritual power is something that is there and something you cannot just brush under the rug. So we know it's of a third person, but it is a power that declares both him and his son. All right. So coming back. In the Old Testament, if you look up the word spirit, it comes from the Hebrew H73007, which is in the concordance, and it's pronounced ruach. Now, there's actually two. We're going we're gonna to go right to the end. When we get to the end, there'll be another one I'll share, and I'll, I'm sharing at the end to kind of start and end with the same point. Okay. Um, and it means wind, first of all, by resemblance breath, that is a sensible or even violent exhalation. Okay, so there's two definitive powers that really help us understand how God works. First of all, it's wind, and the second is mind, and you're going to see it in a moment. Okay, figuratively, life, anger, uh, subst uh, unsubstantially, ups, unsubstantiality, by extension, a region of the sky, by resemblance, a spirit, by only of a rational being, and this is where we need to understand it, including its expression 
and functions. This is the point that we're going to be focusing on today. Air, anger, blast, breath, cool, courage, mind. You see the word mind is mentioned there. Quarter, side, spirit, tempest, vein, or whirlwind. Now, also, we'll be pointing out a point where it talks about a whirlwind in one of the scriptures in a moment. Now, Isaiah 40, verse 13 says this is what this is what the, this is what the prophet isaiah says okay and what he says and what paul says in romans is the very same thing yet there is one word difference now in isaiah it says who hath directed the spirit of the lord or being his counselor hath taught him now we can't we can't just log into god's mind and tell him something we don't telepathically talk to god essentially he telepathically talks to us. It's just, I'm using this expression because this is where the idea of te telepathy comes from. It actually comes from the Bible. Satan has actually taken the very power of God himself and made fun of it. And then we put it into fantasy movies. And as I was expressing last night, I used to watch something called the X-Men. And the main professor of the X-Men has this ability to stop time and speak to anybody at any time through his mind ability. So we can put it into a, a human being in a fantasy show, but we're not willing to take God at his word when he says this is his power. We don't have that power, just like we don't have immortality. These are God-given attributes. Going on. Romans 11.34, and says, Who hath known the, what is the word? Mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor. These are the same words being used, okay? Maybe the sentence structure is a little different, but the point is still carried much the same. Mind, probably from the base of this, the intellect, that is mind, divine or human in thought, feeling, or will, by implication, meaning, meaning mind and understanding. When you look up Romans, this is the concordance word and the definition of that word that you're giving. Let's go on. Spirit. Now, this is spirit using in reference to in the New Testament, because we get I gave you the Ruach, which is the one used in the Old Testament. Now is the same word spirit referring to that which is in the New Testament to the Greek translation. And it says, new, uh, I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, pneuma, a current of air that is breath or a breeze. Okay, remember in the original in the, in the in the Hebrew, wind. And breath is used there. But let's go on. It says, by analogy or figuratively, a spirit, which said the same thing in the other, that is human, such as the rational soul, by implication. And here's the, here's, here's the point I want to focus on. Vital principle or mental disposition, etc. Or superhuman, such as an angel, a demon, or a divine uh, person like God. Christ spirit, the Holy Spirit, or ghost, life, spiritual, or spiritual will, or spiritually mind, or minded, if you will. Okay, so let's just look at the word mental disposition. I'm, I'm highlighting this again. I did it in the first, uh, first uh, study. I'm going to do it again now for good reason. Disposition. A person's inherent qualities of what? Mind and character. What makes the father... So perfect. He's got a perfect mind and he's got the perfect character. And it's based around what? Love. Okay. The Ten Commandments we know are characteristics that define God's love and define actually his mind, his way of thinking, the way he governs the heavens and the earth. And that's why we're going to be focusing on the Old Testament today because it, it, it really points to this very specifically. Two, the way in which something is placed or arranged, especially in relation to other things. So you could see this in relation to uh, creation, for example. Okay, now let's go to Old Testament scripture. We're going to jump straight into this. And notice how Jeremiah is speaking here. Okay, it says from verse 17, They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. For who hath stood, look at notice, please notice the words being mentioned here. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and, what's the words used here? Heard his voice. 
or who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, please notice the next word, yeah, which we just saw in the definition explained of pneuma or ruach. A whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind, and it shall fall grievously upon the what? The head of the wicked. This is not talking about a massive giant whirlwind that comes out of nature and hits a guy on the head. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that the fury of God's mindset and his character and his instruction will fall like a whirlwind on someone's head or their mind. Okay. And we're going to get more clarity on that in a moment. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the what? The thoughts of his heart. And in the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. This is where we are, brothers and sisters. We are in the latter days. And now we are considering this perfectly. This is not what I grew up with. This is not what I understood the spirit of God to work in. This is not what we've been taught through theology in our church, in our church preachings and so on and so forth. It hasn't even been in our study guides. I've never heard this before, but this is what the word of God is saying. Let's go on. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Sound familiar? This is what's happening today. Theology People think they can take God's stuff where God has not given them instruction because you cannot take the written word of God without the spoken word of God leading you on these matters and then run with it. Otherwise, what do you get? Many different churches saying many different things. Isn't that how the world works? Exactly how it works. There's no new thing under the sun with God. Notice verse 22. But if they had stood in my counsel, if they had been obedient unto me, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. I, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? This is also talking about biblical cosmology, but we're not going to get into that. Is God not close and nigh at hand, brothers and sisters? Why do we have to think that God is so far off from us that he is not willing to give us exactly what we need when we call upon him and to be still? It says, be still and know that I am God. Notice how Job speaks. Ooh, this is funky. Let me move that away for a second. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Okay. Notice how Job speaks of spiritual matters here. Job 33 verse 8 says, surely... Thou hast spoken in mine, what? In mine hearing. Okay. And I have heard the voice of thy words saying. And when you look in verse 14, notice how it says here. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Why? Because it's a still small voice. And unless you are silent in self, you won't hear it. You'll think it's, oh, it's just a thought that randomly went over your head and you'll forget it five seconds later. You know the idea that they put, the idea that they put in cartoons with an angel on your one side and the devil on the other side and they're whispering things into your ears? That is also to make fun of the reality of what's going on. You see, God is speaking to us directly, we know, but he's also speaking to us through the ministration of angels. And the devil is also speaking to us through the ministration of angels. Okay, they both have that. That's they're making fun of the reality of how God works and how they know they can work against God and against us. Let's go on. It says now this is also giving a very a very fastened reality as to what Ella White also experienced. Okay, this is just the Lord speaking to him. This is him going into a trance. Okay, it says in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. He then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. You see, God doesn't want us to do the things that we think are right. He wants us to be obedient unto his voice and unto his promptings so that we may prove ourselves worthy of that vocation he has called us to be part of. Behold, God exalted by his power. Who teacheth like him? Who can teach like God? 
And does, do you see God literally appearing in front of you and giving you like a, a, a teaching, like, like you see in a school where he has a chalk and a chalkboard? No. So clearly this is about God talking to you and giving you instruction, either directly or through the ministration of angels. Hast, and going to back to Job 15, hast thou heard the secret of God? What's another word for secret? Mystery. And dost thou restrain wisdom to thyself? This is what we often do. God gives us a little impression and suddenly run with a whole theology after it. We're taking things to pertaining to God. We just take a little tidbit and suddenly we start making this big parade out of it. And God starts shaking his head and saying, you have got just but a mo just but a fraction of what I'm trying to tell you. And you just run away. What knowest thou that we know not? What understandest thou? which is not in us. Now, notice in brackets, I put there John 3, 11. Notice what John, what, jo uh, what Christ is saying to Nicodemus and how John the Baptist confirms the very thing right afterwards. Give me a moment. Please notice how Christ is speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? What is Nicodemus seeing here? He's only seen the human. He's not fully comprehending the divine within Christ. He's thinking just as a man. I don't blame him for saying what he's saying. I would have probably said the same thing. And Jesus said, or well, answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water signifies being justified, being, being baptized with the Spirit, having someone praying to receive the Spirit of God. It's not the man that's touching you. It's He's just praying and recognizing the sovereign power of God and he's praying that God will bless you with that spiritual power so that you may hear him he cannot enter into the kingdom of God and the spirit represents sanctification water is just justified you've made a declaration you've been justified by God and you've sealed yourself to that appointing whereas the spirit is sanctification which is every day we grow through sanctification we grow in the spirit of God we learn to be put away self and our own way of thinking our own spiritual mentality which is carnal and after the flesh and we allow the spirit of god to lead us so that we can become partakers of the what divine nature okay verse six that which is born of the flesh please take a note of the script this piece this line here specifically because this actually represents a, a few things that which is born of the flesh is flesh Talking about us in our carnal in our carnal state, but that or that is which is born of the spirit is spirit. You know the scripture that says God is a spirit. Then it also says the Lord is that spirit. You see, this is gonna. I'm gonna cover this in in another in another um, session specifically on John three, where we actually go we literally go verse by verse on John three. And uh, we, I'm going to do another study on that, um, on this scripture and a lot more in it. And where the spirit of Christ needs to be identified for what it truly is. You see, we as human beings, we, we easily relate to Christ because of his human nature. And I will not do away with his human nature. It's not, no, not relevant. It, what, it is very relevant. But what's more relevant is the fact that he had a divine nature even as a man. Because he was obedient unto his father. And with that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, Christ was conceived, first of all, by the spirit. He grew up in the spirit because no sin was ever in him. He, he, was, he didn't have all that power. That power and glory was given by his father. But his father put that seed within Mary. So you could say he was 100% man. But more importantly, he was 100% God. Hence, Emmanuel, God with us. Okay. It's not just saying God in a man and man is equal to. It's not about being equal. This, it says the spirit, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. The spiritual power of God, which is supreme, which is immortal, which is 
amazing, completely trumps the fact that he had a spiritual nature as well. I'm not saying I'm putting that away. I'm saying his spiritual power completely overrides his flesh. It's more important. And he only did it because he left his nature back with his father. And he was obedient unto his father. He had to still go through the first 30 years of being a man, which was purely based on service, just I'll have you know. And only when he was 30, and as the biological fact explained through, uh, through biology, the last human organ to grow is your brain, and it stops growing when you're 30. Christ, when he turned 30, his brain stopped growing. So God gave him a full measure, a full measure. It says the fullness dwelt within him. So he was now had gone through his physical stages, but now God can give him back that spiritual power that belonged to him. Okay, but it had to do with obedience. The the point is about obedience. And the more we are obedient unto the Father, the more he gives us of that spirit. So this is also talking about us. So when we are born again into the spiritual power, we grow in that spiritual power, just like Christ grew in that spiritual power. And then when we are ready, according to God, not necessarily by age, we become full like him. It says we do not know what we will be, but when, we, when he comes, we will be like him and see him as he is. A full picture of 100% spiritual power. Brothers and sisters, that's what I desire. I'm sure you guys desire the same. But let's move on. It says, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. He's saying, don't focus on those words, being born again. Because hence the question he asked at verse 4. He said, you're focusing on the wrong point, Nicodemus. And watch how he gives the description of the spiritual power. What is the next word? The wind. Because wind describes the power and the might of God's influence. Now, if you think of the elements, which element is the strongest? We think that we think um, fire is, is the most powerful. We know fire is the most powerful in many ways. We know that water is very powerful in many ways. But wind has an extremely fan, fan, fantastic ability about it. Oxygen, oxygen itself is in water. Oxygen itself is in fire. Oxygen is what makes us alive. If it weren't for oxygen, there would be no life. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go on. It says, the wind bloweth where it listeth or where it wishes, and thou hearest the sound thereof but cannot tell where it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Do you see how he's relating here? He's saying that my mind is like the wind and my mind is the wind because he moves on it. If you look, think about the dove that descended out of heaven. What does a dove fly on? Wind. It descended. It moved upon wind. It was a symbol representing God's anointing, the fact that he was justifying his son, but there's a lot more that goes and encompasses it. It's not an or, it's an and. There's so much more to this, but that'll be another subject for another day. Okay, so moving on. It says, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Now watch, I can, I can almost feel that Christ in a way, if it was me, almost being sarcastic with him. Okay, he says, Nicodemus answered, said unto him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered, said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and not knowest these things? Come on, Nicodemus, you know the prophets so well. You know these things. You know how my, what my scripture has said, but you don't know these things? You don't understand? Come on. Now here comes the cruncher or the gut punch, if you will. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our, what's the word? Witness. Who's we? The Father and the Son. That's what it's talking about. And the witness is their declarative power. The Holy Spirit. Go back. Look what it says here. No, at the bottom here, Job. What knowest thou that we no, not. What understandest thou which is not in us? Hence, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. Now, 
If you go to if you go to John eleven thirty two, notice the very same thing. Remember, the Spirit of God is with John the Baptist as well. And this whole study is about how God's Spirit has moved in the Old Testament. Next week we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna spread it hard about how He works the New Testament and even how He works with us directly. So go to John three verse thirty two. John is saying the same thing here. Sorry, I just skipped past it. John is saying the very same thing. He's declaring, but now he's talking just about Christ's actual, uh, Christ's part in this we. Here. It says, and what he had seen, which is Christ, and have heard, hath he testified, and no man received his what? Testimony. You see, the witness and the testimony go hand in hand. Okay. He that cometh from above is above all. I'm going just to the verse, the verse before it. He is above all. Who is above all? This is talking about Christ. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. And he that cometh from heaven is above all. Christ is above all things. Why? Because he has the power of his father with him. It's that simple. There's nothing else complicated about it. I take this on faith, brothers and sisters. I cannot go off the mark. If that's what he says, that's what it is. Simple. Now check here. If you go to 4 verse 24, in John 4 verse 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. Where does the spirit originate from? The Father. We know that Christ is the mediator of God's spirit to us, but the spirit represents the witness. And in truth, what does the truth represent? The testimony. Christ is the truth. This word of God, this written word of God is the written testimony, hence the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can't have a witness without a testament and a testament without a witness. My dear brother Rod clarified this for me when I asked about him being in a court of law. What is admissible and inadmissible in the court? You need a witness and a written statement or a written testimony that has to go hand in hand. If you have one without the other, it's considered inadmissible in court. It's questionable. It's questionable. And if that weren't the case for God's word, then you could say the word is questionable, isn't it? You see, God knows what he's doing. He knows exactly how he's doing it. Now, let's go to, let's go to 1 Corinthians quickly. It says here, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. This is what we were just reading. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That's not just talking about heaven, guys. That's also talking about what we perceive and what we think is real because we're not obedient unto the law. Okay? And just by the way, when you look in the scriptures on this, the word spirit here, the entire way through is ruach, 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 ruach. The whole way through. I didn't put it in, but in the other slides to come, you'll see it. I did put it in. Okay. It says, but God hath revealed them unto us by what? His spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Can you go into the subconscious level of God? Never. You can barely scratch into his normal subconscious. You can't. It's impossible. It's not our ability. It's not what we can do. But God can do it. It's part of what makes him a limitless and amazing, awesome and loving God. I have no limit on God. <laughs> no limit. If that's what it says, that's what it is. Okay. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Now he's comparing it to us. What man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of man or the mind of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. We can't assume to know how God is. We can't assume to take his word without his spirit telling us what his word is. Otherwise, you make what? Philosophy out of it, or commonly known today as theology. You're making theories of God's word, and you're missing the mark every time. Every time. Now, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, which is who? The devil. And the spirit of Antichrist. That's another subject we're going to get into. It's connected to the scripture as well. It's connected to this point. It's all connected. 
Hence the series I'm going to be doing, The Power of the Word. But the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He wants to give it to us. It's a gift He wishes to bestow. And He says, you know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more does God in heaven wish to give us gifts? I'm paraphrasing. The greatest gift God could ever give us is his, his understanding, his mind. I want to know how God it says even the angels desire to look into these things, right? They don't know everything. They're just watching and following the instruction as God gives them instructions. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Why? Because it's foolish, foolishness unto God. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So it's saying, yeah, very straightforward. You cannot know spiritual things and compare spiritual things without spiritual things if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God leading you. Full stop. But it's gone. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth what? Not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are what? Foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. Isn't that what I just said? You cannot know the things of God unless you ask him and listen to his instruction. And he tells you. He must tell you, not the other way around. It's like my it's like my daughter coming to me and asking me about something, and then I just give it, I just look at her and give her a long blank stare. You think God's gonna do that with us? Of course not. He wishes to talk to us. He says, My sheep hear my voice. I wish for them to worship me in spirit and in truth. We just we just read that. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. This is talking about Christ. Okay. But it also talks about God's redeemed. Those that are obedient unto his will. If you have become spiritual, then you are able to judge things according to the spirit that God leads you. Because the prophets judged people when it came to sharp rebuke or being uh, to reprove them or whatever it might be. We are called to do the same thing. Yet he himself is judged of no man, as in no man can judge us. If Christ has justified us, no man can judge us. They can use any comments they want. Doesn't change it. Doesn't change the fact. We still do it in love, but we also do it in boldness. Okay. Well, who hath known the, what does it say? Who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Okay. Here we go. Some examples. All right. So I didn't line this up. I was kind of working in a hurry. Okay. So here it goes. Let's take a further look at how this power on God worked in the Old Testament. Let's look at some Old Testament scriptures. Exodus 31 verse 3. And I have filled him with the what? Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. This is talking about the mind of God talking, guys. God is the one that wants to give wisdom. He's the one that wants to give understanding. He's the one that wants to give knowledge and all manner of workmanship. I cannot lead my day. Brothers and sisters, you cannot lead your day in any job that you have and think you are the one that's going to be able to perfect that end. Let God show you how to be a good carpenter. Let God show you how to be a good chef. Let God show you. I know it sounds silly, but it's not. It's not. God wants to be the director of our lives. He, he wants to show us to prove himself how good he is at doing things through us. And look at this world. We've tried so many times with our own strength. And do we ever get it 100%? No. But with God, it's 100%. So I'm willing to give it a shot. Moses and Aaron. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and said unto Aaron and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, Oh God, the God of the what? Spirits of all flesh. The God that is in control of the minds of all flesh. Shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, How did he speak unto Moses? How? He only spoke on the Mount Sinai when he spoke with a deep voice and everyone was like, ah, I can't handle it. Please go talk to God. We can't handle it. And God spoke to him face to face. Christ spoke to him face to face. But other than that, what is this referring to? It's saying that God speaks to us within the inner chambers of our mind. Last time I'd mentioned as well on one of the studies that 
the body of the body that we have our temple is a representation of the tabernacle and in corinthians there's twice where the word tabernacle is actually referring to our body now think of this the tabernacle has a holy place and a most holy place the conscious mind is the holy place and the subconscious or unconscious mind is the most holy place so where do you think god or christ wants to be in the most holy place the unconscious subconscious mind because when you've allowed him to be there he's basically autopiloting you all the way to salvation make sense but we have to allow that experience to become a reality this is not if anyone's questioning this and saying yeah but that's not choice i'm choosing that i am choosing that me james as an individual i want that to happen because i don't know i know for a fact that i make bad choices I want to choose God and for him to show me. He's not going to control us like robots. That's not how he works. He wants to show us lovingly and kindly. We still have a choice to either obey or not to obey. But we will choose obedience for the rest of eternity because we know God is perfect and loving and kind. And it says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, speak unto the congregation, saying, get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I mean, these guys had the very straight up experience with God literally being there or the son of God, as to say, literally being there. And they still chose to be absolutely silly and blame poor Moses and Aaron for everything. Uh, I was reading it in the spirit of prophecy the other day. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I'll, I'll go really as to say it was stupid of them to even think it, let alone to entertain it. It's ridiculous. Okay. Balaam. Think about Balaam. Look, there's so many scripture references, but I'm just highlighting the really the, the cool ones that does the Lord impress me. So it says, and Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. And the spirit of God came upon him and he took up this his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, and this is there comes the chance piece, and hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open this is what happened with ellen white so it's not just this is not just about god talking to him this is a whole other level this is god putting him into trance and allowing him to transcend into vision and see things far beyond what even a human being can understand okay even seeing the future if you will how goodly are thy tents o jacob and thy tabernacles o israel okay i think he was giving balaam a real a real snippet as to god's wonders and glory right here comes joshua and moses spoke unto the lord saying let the lord the god of the spirits of all flesh here it's mentioned again set a man over the congregation which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in that the congregation of the lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd this is testifying the spirit of God, even through Christ. The Lord here is representative of Christ. Okay. He is our shepherd. He's our mediator. He's our high priest. And we need him to lead us. And the Lord said unto Moses, take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit. Why? He was considered righteous. He allowed himself to communicate with the Lord. He chose to communicate with the Lord. Within his mind, he prayed, must have been a very ardent prayer warrior, and lay thine hand upon him and, and set him up before Eliezer, the priest, and before the, all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. Same thing with Moses with the new generation. Okay. Um, but, but Shion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. So I'm going to expound later um, with Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. It expounds on this point, why the Lord hardened his spirit. Okay, There's a lot of things that happened even during that time, even with Korah, Dath, and Abraham. God knows the beginning from the end. Okay, And he knows exactly how to deal with people. And he knows for a fact when people are just going to be absolutely disrespectful and disobedient against god and there's no way forward only god knows that we don't know that but we take it on faith that he knows how to deal with people okay so he hardened their spirit he said fine you want to be like that be like that go for it i'll allow you to i'll allow you to be that way okay 
And what happened? They completely and absolutely destroyed these guys. God allowed the Israelites to completely go in there and just wipe them out. This is this is the new generation. This is after the, another 40 years when the generation had died off because of their disobedience when they were by the Jordan. Samson. And when he came unto Le Lehi, now this is, this is giving even more understanding of God's spirit and how it works, okay? The Philippines shouted against him. The, uh, sorry, Philistines, <laughs> not the Philippines. The Philistines shouted against him, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. What is it saying? It's saying that God's mind power, God's power in, in and of itself doesn't even, need to have, doesn't even need to be his mind. His power is so limitless, he can increase your physical strength like that. Just like that. Notice what it says on. It says, and he was so athirst and called on the Lord. He said, Lord, help me. And said, thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? But God clave in a hollow place that was, that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof En Hakora, which is in Lehi unto this day. What is this saying? It's saying that he, the spirit of God was upon him, but after doing such a great work, remember, he's still a physical man. The physical takes a lot out of you. And he's not Jesus. This is not Jesus here. He's still a man. So even though it says the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. So the spirit worked through him, but his flesh became weak because he killed a thousand men. And then God, with his spiritual power, did another amazing thing. He clove a, a hollow out of a jawbone and made water come out of it. I mean, come on, guys. There's no power to God's. There's no, sorry, there's no limit to God's power. Here. It's unimaginable. We take it on faith, and this is what it says, then this is what we must believe. Samuel instructing Saul, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into what? Another man. Going from being more from being more carnal to a spiritual standard of man, being obedient unto the Lord. We know that that's, that also changed. Okay, and let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is what? With thee. And when they came thither to the hill, and behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. This is not Saul's power. This is not Samson's power. This is God's power through us and in us. God's anger through Saul. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout the coast of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto these oxen, his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. This is just showing you the limitless power of God's spiritual power. Now, this piece here on, on, on um, coming back here, this is something that was revealed to me this morning. Now, we're talking about God's anger. Just on a side note, it's talking about God's anger through people and what's considered righteous anger and what's not considered righteous anger. And I've been told many a time that only Christ and God can execute righteous anger. Well, what we've just read here in Scripture is showing that God is displaying righteous anger through Saul right? His anger was kindled greatly, okay? His anger was kindled greatly. Why? Well, if you read the rest of Samuel 11, it will tell you why. But notice what it says here in Spirit of Prophecy. I found this quote this morning. It was just, it's amazing how God puts timing together. Dear Gavin Wiggle had actually sent this, and I was like, wow, that's relevant. And the Lord kind of reminded me just to put it into the slide today to give relevance to this situation. So let's read it. It says, many religious teachers of today are themselves breaking the commandments of God and teaching others to do so. Now, remember, we don't follow, we are not yet to follow theology anymore, brothers and sisters. We are to be like Paul and to keep counted as dumb. Yes, it's knowledge that's stored there, but it's now God's power that will recall that knowledge when and how he wishes to have it done. Okay, that's true obedience. That's true, that's true subservience unto our Heavenly Father. 
There's a lot of points that are going to be met out here, but I'm giving the full context as to what is being expressed. Okay, and teaching others to do so. In place of those holy commandments, they boldly teach the customs and traditions of men, regardless of the direct testimony. Notice what it says here, direct testimony of Christ that such ones should be least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus declared to the multitude assembled to hear him, to the Pharisees, who sought to accuse him of lightly regarding the law and to the people of all time, that the precepts of Jehovah were immutable and eternal. Now comes the, the kicker. In a second. The report had been brought of murder and robbery in the wild region near Capernaum, and there was a general expression of indignation and horror in consequence among those who were assembled to hear Jesus. The divine teacher took advantage of this circumstance to point an important lesson and said he, you have heard that it was said of them of old, sorry, said of him of old times, thou shalt not kill, and whatsoever shall kill, uh, shall kill, shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, saying without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool, thou be in a danger of how fire. Why? Imagine for a second, God is being God is leading someone, and you say to them, "Oh, you foolish man! Who are you going against? Who are you going against God through that man, not him?" Here, Jesus describes murder as first existing in the mind, existing in the mind. This is also the whole concept of sinning and where sin originates, whether it's an inner nature thing as well as a temptation from without. Just by the way, it's both. But we're going to get to that another time. The that malice and revenge which would delight in deeds of violence is of itself murder. Jesus goes further still and says, and here comes the gut punch, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. There is an anger that is not of this criminal nature. A certain kind of indignation is justifiable under some, some circumstances, even in the followers of Christ. Please notice this. When they see God dishonored, his name reviled, and the precious cause of truth brought into disrepute by those who profess to revere it, when they see the innocent oppressed and persecuted, a righteous indignation stirs their soul. Such anger, born of sensitive morals, is not a sin. Did you catch that? So... This is just giving clarity to what we just read inside with what happened with Paul and how we, brothers and sisters, when we want to truly serve God and you, you're trying to show, share someone in love and truth and in boldness and they keep wanting to be arrogant with you and eventually you see them start going directly against God and you have this pent up anger within you saying, and it builds, it's not just like instant, but it builds. And then you say to him, what do you think you're doing? For example, that's righteous anger, brother, because and sisters, because the Lord is trying to convict these people with his anger through you. That's what it's saying. But let's go on. It says, among the listeners are those who congratulate themselves upon their righteousness because they have committed no outward crime, while they are cherishing in their hearts feelings of the same nature as that which prompts the assassin to do his fearful deed. Yet these men have professions of piety and conform to the outward requirements of religion. To such, Jesus addresses these words in this way. Therefore, if thou bring, we know this one, if thou bring to the altar and there, rem there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go to thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. He thus shows that crimes originate where? In the mind. And those who permit hatred and revenge to find a place in their hearts have already set their feet in the path of the murderer, and their offerings are not acceptable to God. Notice what it says there. Crimes originate in the mind. So when someone tells you that sin is only an outward expression through temptations, eh? Incorrect. What kind of outward influence 
did Satan need to have to become the father of lies? He didn't have any. It started within his own mind. Cain had never seen murder in his life before, yet he murdered his brother. We have a sinful nature point. Yes, we commit sins, which is a result of entertaining that nature and from an outward influence of temptations happening around us. By beholding, we change into the same image, right? We know that. But we must never, ever forget that we have inherited the same nature as Satan, which starts from within. Hence, David says, I was conceived in iniquity. He was talking about the nature that we are born into, not being a sinner, as in, you know, like, for example, kids are not sinners. They are born with the propensity to sin because of their nature, but they don't know better until a certain age when they actually actually become sinners by being willfully disobedient. But my child never never had, she never learned disobedience from me. It just came from out of her all by herself. Okay, anyway, that's another point. The only remedy is to root out all bitterness and animosity from the heart. But the Savior even goes further than this and declares that if another has ought against us, we should endeavor to what? Relieve his mind and, if possible, remove those feelings from it before our offering can be acceptable with God. Why? Because we are to give our bodies and our minds holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It's a living sacrifice. And to have our minds what? Transformed, changed, and to be renewed, made new again to the Spirit of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You see how it all connects? All connected. There is nothing in the scripture that you can say is this topic or that topic. All these topics are connected, essentially. The lesson is of special importance to the church at this time. Many are zealous in religious services while unhappy differences. Please let this be a gut punch for us all. Many are zealous in religious services while unhappy differences exist between them and their brethren, which it is in their power to remove and which God requires them to remove before he will accept their services. Like I say this, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Yes, God is with you, but is he in you? It's a personal thing. It's rhetorical. I don't need an answer. It's a personal thing we need to ask ourselves daily. Are we being completely 100% submissive and surrendering all of self? Christ has so clearly pointed out the Christian's course in this matter that there should be no question in his mind as to his duty. Simple. So there's a lot of points that can be brought up just with this quote, but let's, let's look at it being God's mind with regards to the subject today. Okay? We want the mind of Christ. That's what we want. Saul's messengers to David, and Paul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. You see, there's no limit to how God works through people. He works through anyone he so deems, if they're willing to. He knows the hearts of all of us. We want to be obedient, and these people clearly want it to be. Azariah. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you, with you, while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Not for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. They didn't have it for a while. But then they, in their trouble, did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, and he was found of them. This is, this is a type and anti-type scenario, brothers and sisters, of what happened then and how it is for us now. This is still applicable. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Bible. Ezra, confirming Jeremiah's prophecy. Now, notice this. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit 
God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. He was speaking as to encourage them in their minds, brothers and sisters. He was talking to them, encouraging them, saying, come, we're going to go back to the land. We're going to build that temple. We're going to continue on with what we were doing. God is so merciful, so loving, so kind. But are we actually listening to him? Job again, all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Same word. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. You won't. As long as you are obedient to God within those five minutes, he's with you and he will speak through you. It's a moment by moment thing, guys. You can literally start your day perfectly with the Lord and in, in obedience to his, in, in his mindset. And suddenly something will pop up and you're like, Ooh. oh, that didn't work. Then you what? You repent because he burns on your conscience. We do things as a good conscience towards God, not the, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not you and your strength by your habits. It's about having a good conscience towards God. You want to please him and you want to be happy in him and obedient unto his promptings. Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the broken order, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Daniel. Oh, Belteshazzar, this is Nebuchadnezzar him talking, it's himself talking. The chapter four is dedicated to Nebuchadnezzar himself. Oh, Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit, this is a different, this is the root of, it's also Ruach, but this is the root of uh, H3, uh, H7307. And we're going to get to that in a moment. It's actually just a simplified version. Because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee and no secret troubleth thee, Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. He believed. Even a foreigner who didn't know God believed that God could work this way. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, which is Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able. Why? For the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Even Nebuchadnezzar recognized this power of God's mind upon Daniel. The Bible is littered with this. Spirit, here's the one used. Corresponding to mind, spirit, wind. Come on, guys. I can't believe I only know this now. <laughs> they should have taught us this in church. But they never did because we have been educated badly on the matters of God, because you're not relying on God's power. So, and some encouragement for us today. And this is where we're going to end. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness's sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul. For I am thy servant. Ecclesiastes. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Okay. And Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5 to end off. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit. Nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Guys. Let us not trust in God. His son, Jesus Christ, and their power. So I was supposed to say their power. They have that comes with them, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Thank you for joining today. Many blessings and much love to you all in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's just end off with a word of prayer. And then we can resume with questions or you guys can skedaddle if you wish. <laughs> Love you guys. All right. Thank you to Heavenly Father in Heaven for the truth of your word. 
to allow it to speak to us and to give us clarity in it. So plain is this. And the mystery which was a mystery is revealed unto us to your saints at this time. Lord, as it says in the book of 1 John, Lord, and in Colossians, you, Lord, have given us the understanding of your word. Because we choose to put away self and allow you to teach us, let your mind, the mind of your son, Jesus Christ, be in us and help us to be obedient unto your promptings. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your powerful word, your limitless power of your mind and, and power displayed through your angels, through your son and even directly. And we give praise and honor to your heavenly father in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen.